I have a very definite consciousness of visual style. I think it is terribly important to a film. I think that simplicity is the finest thing that you can ever achieve. And to achieve it, I think that you have to have gone through first the learning process and then shooting underneath the furniture and shooting the wagon wheel shot, as we call it. And finally getting to the point where you can do the scene very simply, which means doing it very well. I don't know how other people see. It really comes right down to that. I think that we, I think we must, I have a friend, very good photographer, John Bryson, who keeps, who keeps saying in his marvelous Texas accent, I see with my, I, I, I live with my eyes, you know. <laughs> uh, I think that's a statement I can't very well make. I think that, I think you have to train yourself to, to, to see things very carefully in, 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 its minu in the minutest detail. I think you're probably born with it, but I think it's like anything else. I think it's like you, you have to develop it. You have to develop your sense of, of seeing, your sense of noticing details, your sense of, well, your, I think you're born with, the, with a sense of a balance of composition. I don't think that's something anybody can give you. I think that again, but you can learn a great deal. Like for instance, I think that you learn a great deal from painting. I think that, um, I think I have. I think I learned a great deal of, about perspective from looking at, for instance, the work of Gauguin. People like, you know, not people like that. There aren't people like Gauguin. It's Gauguin with his whole use of Japanese perspective. I, I learned a great deal also from certain Japanese painters. Use of forced perspective. I think that many of the images in seconds and the Manchurian candidate came from Magoit. I think the use of balance and how to really frame and how to make one's eye go to certain things. I think that the director owes it to himself to, to study the work of great artists. I think that certainly none of us have ever approached Turner's use of color, but it's great to go to the Tate Gallery and just look at those Turners. Every time you're feeling pretty smug about yourself as a film director and about your use of color and you just go to the Tate and it makes you, it makes you, it makes you a believer with, when you look at what Turner did. I think that um, watching, or not watching, but studying the work of great photographers helps film directors. If you study the work of a photographer like Eisenstadt or Cartier-Bosson or so many, Kappa, I, I've been helped by these, by these things a great deal. You ask me if I see things differently from other people. I mean, you have to tell me that because you see how you see. When I say you, I mean the whoever happens to ask the question. And you see things how I see because you see the result of the work. And that's how I see it. Well, I certainly attempt to. As I said earlier, I try and, I try and surround myself with the best possible people that I can. And by that, I don't mean sycophants. By that, I don't mean yes-men that constantly want to tell you how great you are. I don't particularly want to hear that, and that is a very common thing on film sets. You hear all kinds of people telling the director, oh, my God, you're a genius, you know, and what you're doing is just simply marvelous. Well, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear about what you're doing wrong, because it's much easier to hear about it before you do it than after it. Uh, for instance, you know, when a friend of mine, who was a, a friend of mine, director, a friend of mine, asked me to see his film, I ask him, is it a rough cut or is it the final cut? And if he says it's a rough cut, I'll go and see it and I'll tell him what I think. Because he can then take what I think and, cha and, and, and use it or not use it as he sees fit. By the time it opens in Canada, in New York, in Europe, wherever, it, by then it's too late. By then you get no points for saying what you really think. I mean, what the, what the guy wants to hear obviously is that it's marvelous, you know, and uh, then it's, it's too late to say anything, it's too, it's too late to say anything after the fact. And I find the kind of talk that we're having here very good, but not for films that I've already made. Because quite honestly, I just assume let a lot of those go by. You know, I'd like the critics that like them to keep liking them. I mean, why tell them that they were wrong, you know, if something wasn't very good, you know? Uh, let them keep liking them. Uh, one needs 
All the help one can get in this business. Being a film director is perhaps the most, well, one of the most lonely things that one can be. Because there you are, you've got the responsibility of doing it. Uh, you're supposed to, quote, be an artist, but you've got accountants coming to have meetings with you every night after the shooting. You've got people looking at their watches all around you always. Uh, you've got money men saying, well, he's too expensive, he shoots too much film, whatever. Yet if you make a success, they forget all about that. It's, it's funny to me. It's gotten to be funny. Um, we're supposed to be artists, yet we have to be able to be excellent mathematicians. We have to be able to be expert agents. We have to be able to convince actors to do parts in films. We have to be able to go out and sell films. Uh, it's a very, very schizophrenic occupation. Well, I think that motion picture is not always change and dynam dynamism and, and motion. I think sometimes the static thing in a motion picture can be perhaps the most extraordinary. By that, I mean one of the greatest shots I've ever seen in a motion picture was in Willie Wyler's picture the best years of our lives, when Frederick March and Harold Russell were in the foreground. Russell was playing the piano. March was standing right next to him. And in the background, we had Dana Andrews going into a phone booth to call Teresa Wright to say that he was never going to see her anymore, Teresa Wright being March's daughter. March having had a conversation with Andrews saying, you better break it up, my friend. You're married, and I don't want my daughter running around with you, et cetera, et cetera. March, having been in the service to get, having been on coming back from New York to this place together, and they were they were quite friend they were quite friendly. And you saw this March doing this terrific thing. I mean, knowing the scene that he had played with Andrews before, and knowing that he also knew Harold Russell. And you saw in full focus, in perfect focus. So in perfect focus, Andrew's going into that phone booth. You saw him go in. You saw him have the conversation. You saw March reacting to what was happening out of the corner of his eye. And you saw Andrew's come out. There was a look between Andrew's and, and March. And Andrew's went out of the bar. And the camera never moved. Yet your eye was drawn to the phone booth, to March, exactly where Weiler and where Greg Tolan, the cinematographer, wanted you to, to look. Now, I think that is, that is the height of expertise, if you will, that's the, that's, that's a great, that's a great, a great shot, a great scene. Bergman doesn't move the camera very much. It's usually very well composed shots and the actors move around within the frame. I think that many directors just move the camera to prove that it has wheels. And that's been proven a long, long time ago. But I think that I've done that becoming and, but I find it's much, it's much more difficult in life to have become such as the man has become in the horseman, the greatest horse, the greatest horseman in Afghanistan, then to, to stay with that, to live with that, and to continue to be. And I suppose that, that, that my own feeling in my own life has been that I have become a rather well-known director. Now the hard thing is to stay as that and to continue and to grow from there. And I think that attitude has reflected itself in my soul. I think that I have done enough films to prove to myself that I am, that I'm a fairly good, that I am a professional. And I, I cite that, as I, I, I use the word professional to differentiate between the word amateur. To me, a professional is someone who does something when he doesn't want to do it. An amateur is, some, is someone who does something only when he wants to do it. Uh, there have been many times during my career when I have not wanted to go on a film set and shoot a scene. But yet, I have forced myself to do it, and I've done it. And that is, to me, the mark of a professional, when you can go and do it under any circumstances. All right, now, once I've proved that to myself, I have not yet proved to myself that I am an artist. I don't think I've yet arrived at the point where I have a body of work with which I would like, which, which I would like to represent me as a person, as, I, as my own image. Uh, I think that a lot of my films have had very, very good scenes in them. I do not, I do not think that up until now I have made a film with which I am, with which I would like to say, here it is. You know, that's what I believe and that's what I am as an artist. I haven't done that. And I don't know if I ever will. I think that probably everyone who has ever tried to do this that I do would say the same thing. So 
So if you ask me where I am in my own art, where I am as John Frankenheimer, I'd have to say that I am at a point where I am beginning to become aware of my limitations and I'm trying to surpass them. That's all I can say.